Hello everybody, welcome back. Today we're doing another Strengths of Materials problem. And this problem is good because it's covering a lot of the bases that we covered before, such as centroids and moment of inertia. And it also covers a new topic that I wanted to briefly go over, which is radius of gyration. So let's get started with the problem and take a look at what we're seeing. Uh, determine the distance x bar to the centroid c of the beam's cross-sectional area, which is pretty much this distance from the y-axis to centroid c, which is right at this intersection between x prime and y prime. And remember, these axes are simply representing an axis where that centroid is lying for the entire composite. And then it wants us to compute the moment of inertia i y prime, which is pretty much going to be the moment of inertia with respect to this y prime axis, as it says right here. And then also it wants us to determine the radius of gyration k y prime. So what the heck is radius of gyration? I don't remember talking about this before. So why am I bringing this up now? Well, in dynamics, we may have seen something similar to this formula here. And it's also named something similar as well. It's called radius of gyration in dynamics as well. However, the formula they use is k equals the square root of i, which is moment of inertia, over mass. Okay, And what that formula rep would represent is pretty much the distance from an axis at which the mass of a body is assumed concentrated uh, at a certain point. So if you imagine, let's say we had like a cylinder, you can actually take a radius from the center of that cylinder and concentrate its mass about a fixed point, And it would act similarly as if it was the cylinder in that position as it rotates about that centroidal axis, okay? However, in, in strength of materials, we're dealing with a slightly different formula where this formula is more of a measure used later on so that we can get an idea of a column's tendency to buckle. And what a column's tendency to buckle pretty much means is if you imagined you had a column, a column can buckle like this. It will deflect in a certain direction and its cross section is going to be uh, influencing that type of buckle and how severe it will be, okay? So that's pretty much what it means. Anyways, now we can hop into the problem and actually see what we're dealing with. The first thing we're going to need to do is look at the centroid formulas here and find that x bar that we're looking for. All right, so now we have everything set up so that we can solve for the centroid of the composite shape. Now we're looking straight on at the cross section so we have a better view of everything. And we've divided the shapes up into three separate rectangles to make our lives easier when solving for these centroids. Um, so we can see shape one, we have centroid x1 bar, a distance x1 away from that point. And then similarly with x2 and x3. So what we need to do is find these values, plug them into our x bar formula to solve for that value of x bar. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is simply solve for x1. And we know what that's going to be. For a rectangular shape, we know it's just going to be half of this length since we are right beside that y-axis. Parallel to it, we're going to take one half of 30 mil right here, which is going to equal 15 millimeters. And then moving on to x2. We have a similar thing, except first we need to consider this 30 mil distance away from that y-axis and then half of this 70 mil distance uh, to get that total distance away from x2 to the y-axis, all right? So pretty much what that's going to look like is we have 30 mil plus one half of that 70 mil, which is going to equal to 65 millimeters. Then similarly, with x3, we follow the same principle of adding that 30 mil for that third shape down here, and then half of 170. So we have one half of 170 in that formula as well, leaving us with 115 millimeters. Next, we need to solve for the areas to use this formula. So area one is simply going to be area for a rectangular shape, and area one is going to be 30 plus 100, 40 plus 30, which is 200 mil. So we have 200 times the length of it, which is going to be 30 mil. And then multiplying those together is going to give us 6,000 millimeters squared. Area two and area three are going to follow the exact same principles. So we have 30 times 70 for area two giving us 2,100 millimeters squared. And then same for the bottom, which is 30 mil times 170 this time, 
which is going to give us 5,100 mil squared. Now let's plug this into the formula and see what we get at the end. And this will leave us with a final answer for x bar equal to 61.6 millimeters. And we can see the units cancel out to give us that millimeter to the power of one coefficient. Okay, so that's the first part done. Now we can move on to the trickier part, which is gonna be finding that moment of inertia about the y prime axis. All right, moving on, we can look at the moment of inertia about the y prime axis. And in order to avoid some confusion, I'm gonna add a bar on top of this y prime axis, just to avoid confusion when we get into the calculations, because we have iy prime, which is actually representing the centroidal moment of inertia for each of these individual rectangular shapes. And as a recall, I've added this section here just so we can take a look and remember that for a rectangular shape with a conventional axis system running through the centroid, we have the moment of inertia about y equal to one half height times base cubed. So how can we start solving this problem? Well, the first thing we need to do is look back at the formula and recall what it means. So we have this dx value that we need to calculate for each of these separate shapes that make up our composite. So pretty much that means it wants us to find the distance from that axis we're referring to, which is y bar prime, up to that centroid of the shape. So for shape one, we would be looking at d1. And pretty much what that distance is going to be is we're going to take that distance from y to the centroid that we found previously, which is 61.6 millimeters. And we're going to subtract the centroid of the shape one, which is 15 millimeters, which we found previously. All of this is in brackets. And when we solve that, we're going to be left with 46.6 mil. And it's a pretty similar process for D2 and D3. So for D2, what we're going to do is we're going to take that centroid that we calculated previously, which is going to be 65 from y to that point, and then subtract that distance from y to the centroid that we found before. And this will give us 3.4 millimeters. And then D3, very similar thing. We're, ta we're taking that value, 115 from before, subtracting that distance from y to the centroid, and getting 53.4 for that value. Next, we can move on to simply plugging and chugging. And how are we going to do this? We are going to look at y bar prime. That's our relative axis. And the formula is going to remain the same from that point. So i y plus a dx for each of these composite shapes. So for our first shape, we're going to have 1 half considering this formula here, height times base. So the height is going to be 30 plus 140 plus 30, which is going to be 200 mil, multiplied by that base, which is 30, and that's going to be to the power of 3. Then we're adding the area of the shape, which we calculated previously, as 6,000. Then multiply that by the distance that we calculated up top, so 46.6 mil, oh, let me erase that, 46.6 squared, and then all of this is going to be in millimeters to the four. And then we proceed similarly with each of the other shapes. Which will leave us with a final value for a moment of inertia about y bar prime equal to 109 point one four times ten to the power of six millimeters to the fourth power. Then lastly we can use this value to calculate our radius of gyration. So radius of gyration in our case is pretty simple where we have ky prime is going to equal to the moment of inertia that we calculated about that axis over the total area of our composite shape. So we have all these values already determined. So we have 0, 109.14 times 10 to the power of 6 millimeters to the 4 over the total area, which is going to be 6,000 plus 2,100 plus 5,100. And that will all be to millimeters squared. This will leave us with a final answer for the radius of gyration about that axis 
equal to 90.93 millimeters. And that is your final answer for radius of gyration, along with the other final answers that we already solved for previously. Okay. So I hope this video helped, guys. Thanks for watching.